we we move forward to I, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Thomas Susi. He received his uh, doctorate in nanomaterials from the Department of Applied Physics at the Aalto University School of Science in Finland, where he has he has uh, uh, performed a postdoc of two years before moving eventually in 2013 here to Vienna for uh, another postdoc position. Uh, he was leader of the um, of an Austrian of Science found uh, standalone project, and since 2017, recipient of an ERC static grant from the European Research Council. Uh, very recently, now in 2019, he has be become pro assistant professor in the unit of physics of nanostructural materials here at the Faculty of Physics at the University of Vienna. Uh, um, Dr. Thomas Susi is also an advocate of open access since many years, and is, is part, as part of the board of the Young Academy of Europe, he has been involved in drawing up a statement of the implementation of guidance of planets, about which he will speak now. Please. Thank you, thank you very much. And it's, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I've rarely seen the, the room this full, so great job from the organizers in drawing attention to this event. Um, Yes, indeed. So I realized that, that I also should slightly introduce open access in case somebody is not familiar with these concepts. And um, even though I am in no way a representative of Plan S, I have spent a lot of time trying to understand all of its details and also actually talk to the architects of the plan quite extensively. And these slides are originally from Mark Shields, who is the president of Science Europe. So it's as close to the horse's mouth as we're, we're going to get today, but it's, it's pretty close. Um, so open access refers to the, the unrestricted access to research outputs, typically just research articles, journal articles. And there are no access fees, and that's the important point. We'll discuss the other costs of open access potentially, but there is no fee for, to access the article and to read the article. And in a more broader conception, uh, especially P Peter Suber, who is kind of the grandfather of, or uh, very visible advocate of the open access movement, is that it also needs to be free of most copyright and, and reuse restrictions. And that's where we get into uh, questions of open licenses and so on. So what are the motivations for open access? There's at least four, and, and this is how Science Europe phrase, phrases this, uh, frames this issue, and I kind of agree with that. First, if you have publications behind paywalls, there are many institutions around the world who, who scientists cannot access these articles. And if you can't read the latest research, you are not able to, to participate in the modern research, uh, research um, throughout the world. The other is, is societal. So most normal people of the public, you might have a spouse or a, or a family member who has some rare disease. And you might be able to, to look in the internet and try to find papers and research that actually um, addresses this disease. But normally, normal people don't have access to the, to the subscriptions and to the journals, and they won't be able to do such things. And, and there are other actors within societies that, that perhaps don't have that much access either. And then there's the ethical point, which for me personally is, is quite compelling, which is that this research, our salaries, our, our university, our research project, this is funded by taxpayer money. We are, we are not doing this out of the goodness of our heart. We are perhaps doing this out of a passion for science, but we are funded by, by taxpayer money. And it is ethically extremely problematic that private companies are given ownership of, of the results of publicly funded research. And that's been a big motivation. And then there's the fourth point, which I won't talk a lot about, but Brigitte perhaps addresses the costs a little bit more. The current system has simply become uh, economically un unsustainable. Even the richest universities can't afford anymore to access, uh, to pay for the access to all of the literature. Just a few words about, um, about the history of open access. So this has been roughly a topic of conversation from the early 1990s. And especially the, the declarations, uh, various declarations in Budapest, Bethesda, and Berlin around 2002 were kind of putting the, the framework and the, the conception of the modern open access. What does open access mean and why do we want it and what should be the goal for, for open access? And since then there has been many statements, many political statements uh, by various countries, various nations, EU, US, what have you, 
it's a very um, complicated history, but there's been a kind of a consensus that we should have open access to, to publicly funded research. Uh, it's just how do we get to that goal, which has, has proven perhaps more difficult than many people suspected. So I've been, I've been quite intensively interested in this topic since about 2012, when together with uh, my friend Jani Kotakoski in Finland, we were participating a bit in the national discussion. At the time, back in 2012, it was, uh, there was a kind of a flurry of activity that uh, led to some people call it an academic spring after the Arab Spring uprisings, but uh, in hindsight, that was perhaps a bit naive, not much has, has changed since then. But one thing that we should understand in the context of open access, if, if you're not familiar with this, that, that there are two ways to achieve open access. One is that the publisher makes the paper openly available. And some publishers do this even without a fee. There are so-called diamond open access journals who publish, uh, for example, Baustein Journal of Nanotechnology from the uh, German Baustein Institute. They do not charge any fees to publish the articles to, and make them openly accessible. But in most cases, uh, typically the institution or a national library consortium pays an open access fee and that unlocks the, the article on the publisher side. And this is called gold open access. Gold coming perhaps from money and, and gold. Uh, so that's something to uh, keep in mind. The other route, which is a completely viable form of open access, and it's very often left out in, in discussions and a lot of the critiques of Plan S, for example, uh, is that there is a way to have open access without paying any money. And that is for the researchers who write the article, after all, they write it. Uh, to submit their manuscript uh, into an open repository. And archive in physics is, of course, the most famous example of this. And, and most researchers in physics actually use this these days, or at least a large proportion. Um, it will not be typeset and branded in the, in the publisher's uh, format, but the content of the article can be exactly the same, especially if you put all the uh, latest changes after peer review uh, into, the, into your manuscript version. And currently, this is more by most publishers only allowed after a so-called embargo period of between six to 12 months. In some, some social sciences, for example, can be up to two years. And so there is, there is a delay. And there is also the fact that, yeah, the manuscript version is a little bit different from the final published version. They might be typesetting, ty typos corrected, something like that. But, but there are m multiple ways and not all of them necessarily cost money. And that's something to keep in mind. So why are we having Plan S? Why, why are we making this rather, in some, some people might say, radical uh, proposal or, or, or mandate to, to achieve more openness? Um, open access has been growing for many years, it's true, but we're still nowhere near the target of, of having all of scientific research openly available. It varies field by field, country by country, certainly, but, but roughly in the, we're in the range of a bit more than one quarter, maybe one third, depending a bit. And there's an additional problem is that uh, a lot of this open access growth is coming from the gold open access route, and not just from the pure open access journals, but, but through so-called hybrid model. And in hybrid model, the publishers keep on publishing the same journal, which they sell to the libraries for the same amount of money as before. And in addition, they receive one, two, sometimes 5,000 euros to make one article in this journal open access. So that's why it's called double dipping. They're kind of dipping their hands into the money pot twice, once from the libraries and once from the uh, open access fees. And, and this hybrid has really, it was, it was sold by the publishers as something of a, of a transitional model that, you know, we'll take small steps and gradually we will go into the fully open world. And the reality is that the, the proportion of hybrid, hybrid open access has increased a lot more than, uh, than pure gold open access. Uh, the values here are for the, for the journals, not the proportion of articles, but how many journals offer this hybrid option or, or are fully gold open access and so on. And and so it's not really the, the state of affairs that we would ideally want. And the additional point is that hybrid is typically more expensive because you're paying for the prestige of the journal. And that's really how the system works. You pay for the name of the journal and that's why they are able to charge higher, higher fees. 
There's a huge variance. Some are free. Uh, well, hybrid journals, probably not really many. Um, but they are, on, on average, a little bit more expensive. And one point about the costs. So paying a fee to publish an article, yes, that costs money. But paying uh, for publishing in a subscription journal costs even more. This is something we, we sometimes forget. Publishing industry has enormous profits, and that money is coming from the public purse. So every subscription article you, uh, you publish in a subscription journal, somebody is paying for that journal, even if it's not you personally. It's your national library consortium, typically. And that is on roughly on the order of more than 5,000 euros per article, any article that's published currently in the world. So publishing costs an enormous amount whether it should, even in the open access world, cost anything, there are some initiatives that say that we should be perhaps 100 euros or something to cover just the basic minimal cost, or maybe even nothing. But, but subscription is not free. It's just not you personally who is footing the bill. And then the oligopoly got mentioned. So since the market has concentrated into the hands of so many uh, publish, so few publishers, um, they have enormous market power and they can shut off entire countries' uh, access when they don't get the deals that they want from these countries. And now the University of California library system is also battling Elsevier. And um, if you follow this field, there are news about this all the time. Some country has lost access because they refused to, uh, refused to pay as much as the publisher wanted or the publisher refused to make the, as much open access as the, as the library consortium wanted. So this is the reason why there is Plan S. There's been change, but it hasn't been fast enough, and it's, it's going in a direction that, that funders, uh, many funders don't find to be healthy for the publishing system. And, and that's why the EU Commission President Juncker appointed uh, Robert Jan Smits as an envoy last year to find a quick solution, how can we actually achieve open access by 2020 or from 2020. And one thing to always also keep in mind, which is often missed in these critiques of Plan S, that this was based on a political decision by all member states back in 2016. The 2020 date, the open access goal, this was a political EU level decision. It's not something cooked up by the funders. The funders are trying to make that happen uh, by the mandate of, the, of this Plan S. But, but it's not their kind of rogue acting and making our life more, more difficult. This is a political decision on the whole EU level. And I don't, won't go into the details of all the principles and guidelines for the implementation. There are, there are many and some of them are quite technical, but the, the basic principles are easy enough to grasp. So the, the basic idea is that no publication should be behind a paywall. If it's funded from public funds, it should be openly available. And it must be immediate, so they, are, they, they do not allow embargo periods. You can't wait 12 months until the open uh, article becomes available. Uh, as an aside, there, nobody has been able to demonstrate any harm to the profits of publishers from shortening embargo periods. They say that their business will be destroyed if we allow immediate access, but there is absolutely no evidence that I'm aware of of this. And they haven't been able to show that either. There needs to be publication with an open license that allows text and data mining and, and reuse, uh, of course, with proper attribution. So you still have to cite the people who, whose work you're relying on. That's not going anywhere. Uh, and there shouldn't be any more transfer of copyright from the researchers to the publishers. Um, there should be more transparency, or ideally full transparency, over the pricing of, of subscriptions and gold uh, and these transformative agreements that we'll hear about and the pricing of, um, of the contracts and their conditions. Now there's been, I was peripherally involved in Finland in a freedom of information type request to get some details about Finnish uh, contracts with publishers and they, uh, the Finnish activists really had to fight in the courts to, to get these contracts open. And hybrid uh, will be disallowed except as a transitional stage and we'll hear a little bit more about that. And so in total, there's 10 principles and eight areas of implementation guidance, but as I said, um, the details are somewhat complicated. And it is different to other, other policies because it aims to align different national policies. There's been policies from the FVF in Austria that have been very progressive and very uh, forward-thinking and good, but 
publishing is a global business and having a global set of open access policies would really help. Um, and it also is no longer a political statement. It's a mandate. If you get money from us, you have to do this. And, and that is also something that is different to before. And, and, and since there's been so many statements and relatively little progress, uh, the funders felt that they have to make this a, a mandate, a real requirement, and not just a statement of intent or, or wish. Um, they also, also uh, commit to covering costs of this transition, not only the article processing charges, but also supporting new platforms and, and journal flipping. How that's going to work in practice, of course, is, is, is yet to be seen. And the timeline is set to 2022. And it is really about they always stress this, that it is about the principles of openness and not about the specific publication model. And Jerome Bosman and Bianca Kramer from, from the Netherlands have done an analysis of nine possible ways that you could be compliant with this uh, open access mandate. And not all of them cost money again. And not all of them, uh, yeah, not every journal will allow every way, of course, but there are many, many different ways to be. Uh, certainly not something you can, you can read now. Um, and involved currently are many important national funders, importantly for Austria, the Austrian Science Fund is, is in and is a very active voice in this coalition. Uh, European Research Council and Horizon Europe will, as, as of current information, also be participating in this mandate. So some of the most prestigious Europe, uh, research in Europe will be uh, under this mandate. And there are some very important biomedical funders, foundations and also uh, some uh, international funders that are also also coming in. Um, so the way forward that, that we know now is that uh, last year these guidelines were published. They, they uh, invited public comment about them, uh, which garnered some 600 responses. Some of them have been publicized like ours, but others we don't know what's in them yet. Um, Coalition S will publish all of the, all of the responses eventually. And we expect the uh, updates to the implementation guidelines uh, still in May. So then that will be the final implementation guidance. And also in, in Plan S, the, the way that we, ch the importance of changing the way we, we uh, assess and reward science, that is centrally there. They mentioned the so-called San Francisco Declaration of uh, Research Assessment, DORA, as a central part of it. And that really is, is an important point. I was working on, on our statement. We spent dozens of hours probably looking at the guidelines, trying to understand each and every point of it, and, and really consulted with experts. And, and uh, they did not do the best job. Some of the points in the guidance were actually unclear and even contradictory. And so we pointed those out. And we also um, yeah, gave some opinions about what things perhaps should be changed. Uh, in, the, in the resulting final guidance. And we'll see uh, what that will be in the end. And, and we, were, we were in Brussels in person, so that's the Secretary General of, of Science Europe, and, and she was the personal assistant of Robert Jan Smits, and we were giving this feedback there and discussing each and every point for more than an hour or so that they really got the feedback uh, that we wanted to give. So now we wait how it will be updated and what the final guidelines will be. Um, more information, always their website, uh, not me. As, as their spokesperson, I'm, I'm not. So I'm just been spending a lot of time on this topic and I uh, have some knowledge of this, but they are the, the authority, of course, on this. And thank you very much. Thank you.